Good day, everyone, and welcome to, uh, I think this is the fifth um, online um, seminar in the Lab to Fab series, uh, which culminates in uh, um, in-person meeting uh, in September in beautiful Whistler, British Columbia. My name is John Cook, and I'm at the University of Ottawa. I'm a poor replacement for Professor Karen Hinzer, um, who would normally be uh, moderating the session, uh, but she is triple booked as usual and at the moment is hosting a, a Create uh, Summer School with um, a very interesting program, not unlike uh, some of the things we're talking about here. Um, our guests for the hour we have today are uh, Narish Mariala, Valen Razazadeh, and Aaron Rishu, um, all originally, I think, from Alberta, and so I'm feeling a little out in the cold here in Ottawa. But I can claim that um, I did my doctoral work uh, in at UBC um, a horribly long time ago, so perhaps um, not quite so far away. Um, so uh, you may be aware that the Lab to Fab um, activity has been running now for, I think, seven years, founded in um, uh, 2015 by uh, CMC Microsystems as a forum for industry, academic, and government um, labs and uh, staff to collaborate, looking at the, um, the piece going from late R&D into manufacturing, which as I know from personal experience, is a bit of a fingernail biter. Um, it can be a difficult time. And uh, sometimes that's where uh, <clears throat> new business is founder. The, the, the premise is that Canada has an awful lot of excellent facilities and, and very powerful and capable equipment across the country, but it is distributed. And what can we do to get more bang for the buck um, uh, from all of those facilities and people? And how can we bring not only the tools to the wafers or work pieces, but uh, can we bring people together, getting the right partnerships to, uh, to kickstart um, valuable industries uh, down the road. And can we look ahead and see <laughs> the famous crystal ball, um, where things might be going in future and try to anticipate those and get ready for them. Um, one new activity this year is, uh, is uh, called the Rising Stars, uh, which helps to identify young folks still in their university work or early in their careers um, with particular interests to particular companies and outfits. And the, uh, there's a contact there, Andrew Fung with CMC, uh, to get uh, registered for that. And in September, um, you will be identified and, uh, and a lot of cheerleading and hand-waving will go into getting your name forward. Um, Whistler, uh, 25 to, uh, September. And uh, there's the, the, the theme uh, this year. And, um, oh, there's Karen, okay. That's uh, Professor Karen Hinzer. Um, as I say, I'm a poor substitute. Okay, uh, let's thank our sponsors. The gold sponsor for this year is uh, Lucida Photonics. And I'm very glad to see that um, a numerical modeling outfit is is prominent in um, in this activity because, of course, with new, with effective numerical modeling, you can save a lot of time and a lot of um, money. Uh, <clears throat> assuming you've done a good job verifying your models, Eponics is the silver sp sponsor, and um, they are uh, exploiting silicon nitride devices. Uh, uh, the Quantum Matter Institute and the Silicon Epic um, program at the University of British Columbia are also sponsoring. And of course, we're um, grateful uh, and pleased that CMC Microsystems has undertaken this activity. It's going to be and is already very valuable. Uh, so today we are very fortunate to uh, welcome uh, Narash Muriala, Valen Rosazadeh, and Aaron Rishu. We rehearsed the pronunciations of those just before we started um, to speak today. Each uh, speaker will have about 10, uh, 15 minutes, including a short question and answer period. 
And at the end of this, um, we'll open the microphones and the internet uh, for a general discussion on um, on whatever topics come well within reason, of course. And um, the program is there. And the general idea, just to focus our discussions a little bit, is ways to better connect startups to fabs, um, advice to how to start up uh, in semiconductors and any advanced technology of a device that demands um, high performance fabs uh, and, and so on. So I'll just mention that there is one more of these uh, online workshops in August. And then it's uh, September in Whistler. Uh, welcome Naresh, who, um, who did his uh, doctoral work at University of Alberta, 2016 in materials engineering, and uh, then went further afield uh, it to NINT, in a National Institute of uh, Nanotechnologies, now renamed, I think, Nanotechnology Research Center, uh, followed by more MEMS uh, work with Teledyne and um, holographics, and he then found himself in uh, Sherbrooke, which is becoming a wonderful center um, for semiconductors, MEMS, and advanced devices of all kinds, along with Bromont and C2MI and 3IT, uh, really an exciting location, and then joined Strathera as their R&D process engineer. So uh, I guess we don't do applause with these things, do we, Brent? <laughs> That's too bad. Um, I, cause I was just at a, a session this morning where, uh, it was in person, which is refreshing, but I'll turn it over now to, um, to Narash. Yeah. Uh, hi, John. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much for, for the introduction. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to, um, uh, have your time here and uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, I hope everyone is enjoying, uh, is a good summer weather out there in Canada. Um, <clears throat> a bit about myself as I, uh, as John introduced. Uh, uh, so basically I did my PhD in the University of Alberta and then went on uh, 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 working in different, uh, different MEM startup culture. Uh, and I have been fortunate to experience uh, some of the good locations and uh, go through the entire uh, process of, uh, you know, what makes it to have commercialization. So today I want to discuss about uh, uh, what are the typical challenges faced by uh, startup companies, uh, especially based on MEMS technologies, and uh, how we can actually pull resources together, being in Canada, uh, and you know try to uh, face some of the challenges to, uh, together. And first of all, uh, I would like to thank CMC for giving me the opportunity as well as uh, taking this initiative to develop this ecosystem uh, uh, for semiconductor manufacturing as well as, well as MEMS development. Um, I will I'll share my screen, uh, basically just to go over uh, what I would um, what I would like to discuss this afternoon. Uh, can everybody see my screen? I don't see. Yes. Yep, I can see you, Martin Arish. Okay, perfect. Yeah. And may may I just mention that the chat uh, function is active. If you need to wave. A hand and get our attention for uh, technical reasons. Um, please use the chat, and we will do questions after Naresh's talk. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, so basically, uh, I just want to explain uh, who we are, uh, what we do, and uh, in my opinion, in my uh, view, uh, through my experience, what is the path to commercialization? Again, the path to commercialization is very, very subjective and depends on. Uh, what technologies you are offering to and uh, how tough those things are the competitive advantages and the landscape and everything so i'll try to go over you know probably the simplest and uh, uh, a linear path to commercialization which which is never going to be the reality uh, i'll explain what the what are the typical challenges i have faced being a part of uh, uh, in the mems industry for five years or five to six years uh, focusing on entrepreneurship and uh, what are the lessons we have learned? Uh, I would like to keep uh, the lessons and challenges faced uh, typically to the uh, to the work that I'm doing right now, which is a, a MEMS uh, uh, R&D process engineering and packaging specialist in Statera. So let's see how, how that goes. 
Um, so who we are? Basically, we are a bunch of tech enthusiasts. So we are all trying to provide uh, MEMS-based solutions. And uh, uh, you know, we read and uh, we all our academics are into, into the MEMS fabrication, the design, and uh, uh, um, trying to find uh, MEMS-based solutions. Um, here at Statera, we are on a mission to transform the, uh, the timing market uh, from a 100-year-old quartz-based solution. So every time when we hear uh, a timing, a perfect uh, pitch time, so we always uh, fall back to quartz. And then uh, that quartz has been sustaining from past 100 years, which is huge for any of the you know, material itself to have that, uh, uh, that much crazy uh, platform. Yes, quartz is amazing, uh, but it's not coping up with the, the new advances and the especially amazing uh, uh, technologies built on the uh, around silicon. So probably that's uh, that's what opened up the vacuum for uh, you know some of the new technologies and innovations and ideas. We are a subsidiary of uh, Nexense. Nexense is basically an umbrella of uh, uh, of uh, it's a bigger umbrella, and uh, we we try to have different solutions that. Uh, 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 to and commercialize the MEMS technologies. So one of the uh, commercialized technology that we have, uh, it's in the form of a company now, which is a Mayo One, uh, which is a healthcare application for MEMS pressure sensor. And the second idea that we are working on is the silicon-based MEMS oscillators, which are basically uh, trying to address the timing market. Um, so timing is basically everywhere. Everywhere where you have a synchronization required, where you have a clock sticking require, and all electronic gadgets will have some or other uh, frequency counters or uh, frequency reference points or the timing devices. So the 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 cycle here shown is basically uh, typically what are the applications, especially in communication, uh, all the electronic components and electronic product products like uh, printers and uh, laptops and wearable technology, IOTs, and especially nowadays with automotive applications. So everywhere you see, everywhere you have this uh, uh, reference, uh, the frequency reference and the timing applications. And um, the idea, the forecast here is by 2025, every car will have almost 50 to 70 uh, MEMS uh, devices in it. And especially most of them are focusing on uh, uh, timing applications. So there's a huge market for uh, MEMS, uh, uh, not MEMS, basically there's a huge market for, for timing and uh, uh, frequency applications and uh, and we we have a problem as i mentioned before the problem is the uh, quartz the quartz based oscillators are they're bulky and uh, uh, they need uh, two additional capacitors to run the circuit and they cannot uh, quartz is a material that is uh, cut and machined to to give a stable frequency it is in kilohertz and megahertz um, so every every frequency is made of a different crystal oscillator. So as shown in the figure, the problem is basically the quartz, which is bulky. It takes lots of board space and uh, it requires other components. And what our solution is basic, basically a, a silicon-based MEM solution, either in the form of a separate component, as mentioned in the first, or maybe integrated in a chip. So on-chip solution, uh, that is uh, the, the advanced solution that we have. And uh, um, there are uh, lots of lots of advantages of having a, a silicon based MEMS oscillators, even though uh, we need to come up with innovative ideas to make it uh, temperature sensitive, uh, uh, temperature insensitive, because uh, quartz is amazing material, which is uh, temperature stable, uh, but silicon is not. And uh, there are a lot of techniques that we can employ, uh, innovative methods we can do to make sure that uh, the silicon based MEMS oscillators are temperature stable. Um, and once the the MEMS category comes in, and the whole uh, supply chain system and the everything can uh, we can levitate on the fully established VLSI technologies. Um, so I I would uh, I would not prefer to go to uh, in details of uh, you know why MEMS is preferred more than ceramics because it's a it's a it's a fundamental thing and many people already know it. Uh, I would like to just focus on. Uh, why Statera MEMS oscillators are advantageous? As I mentioned, uh, we have one chip that can produce uh, two outputs. So we call it as a dual output, which is a kilohertz signal uh, that is good for room temperature, uh, time uh, timekeeping applications. And the other one is a megahertz signal, which is, a, uh, which is good for communications and uh, GNS and uh, all other high frequency communications. 
Um, so uh, as I mentioned, we can make it uh, uh, ultra stable across the temperature, depending on few innovative techniques, which are amazing, amazing. And uh, uh, thank God for silicon and silicon oxide as a material. Uh, so we, we can do lots and lots of uh, uh, creative innovations in that. Uh, and uh, other thing is uh, they're extremely small uh, in terms of mass. So that's why they are they have good vibration and shock resistance, almost 40 times better than the quartz crystal oscillators. And as you all, uh, all are aware, uh, MEMS and silicon based uh, components are uh, low in power, uh, power requirements and uh, they have a longer battery life. And the most important thing is uh, the, the space uh, occupied on the board is like uh, uh, almost 10 times lower than what is uh, required onto the quartz oscillator. So these are clearly, clearly some distinct advantages uh, comparing to the oscillator market, uh, comparing to the uh, quartz oscillator market. And uh, there are good innovations happening in quartz as well. But the but the supply chain and the entire industry that is developed is uh, is pretty um, uh, pretty difficult to uh, bring in any any innovations. And uh, uh, as uh, on parallel to the silicon industry. Uh, so that's where uh, there is a, a problem and we have a solution. Uh, don't be alarmed by this uh, texty slide. Uh, I'll try to go over uh, simply, uh, you know, just the few, few blocks. Um, and the path to commercialization in my view is basically, uh, I, have, I have color coded the diff different boxes uh, and also mentioned what are the big items in each. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I, I was trying to, you know, get how much time it takes uh, for each box and, you know, try to get more information, but uh, it's it's never going to be this linear. So the, the arrows that I mentioned, uh, all are very linear, but it, it never happens in the real life and it's always messy. We always go back to the backboard and then start looking at the design and, you know, a lot of things like even at the packaging, uh, at the packaging time as well. So there are still calculations that are done at the, at the blackboard. So let me just... Uh, give an overview of uh, what uh, the, the commercialization can take place. The first thing is idea phase where uh, you have a good idea, uh, where you know that the design is, you can design a MEMS oscillator that can, uh, MEMS, not oscillator maybe, any uh, any sensor or any component on the MEMS uh, that can actually solve some problems and you verify them by uh, doing lots of uh, simulations and uh, uh, in the academic labs and everywhere. So here, um, there are great resources by CMC, uh, uh, which we can uh, um, levitate onto. So which is uh, probably we are also a part of that CMC network system, where uh, we can use uh, we can use its uh, simulation softwares, LEDIT, and all other uh, important softwares for for reasonably low cost. Um, and also, Mitax is a great source of uh, um, uh, resource for small scale uh, uh, projects internship and funding and everything so the idea phase is essentially to come up with an idea and that you have a problem and you can address the problem by design and the early success is where you have uh, build some university uh, uh, some uh, some prototype run not prototype runs the initial runs uh, just to see the proof of concept uh, using university fabrication facilities and uh, uh, I, I should say nint and uh, um, Nanofab, Nint, uh, and 3IT are amazing in my experience. They have uh, they have they have amazing amazing facilities. Uh, I I worked there, so I I kind of know uh, what level of uh, sophistication they achieved uh, during the years. Uh, and one uh, caution here is uh, uh, in the early phase of success, we have to be super super pessimistic uh, because like it, it's it's not a, it's not a rosy path. So we need to be. Uh, very pessimistic and then then comes the prototype run where you have a, a multi-project wafer settle runs uh, so basically the essence of this prototype run is to have a standard process flow develop uh, all the required items to figure out the fabrication process flow and make continuous changes to the design lots and lots and lots of changes and characterize the uh, die thoroughly in and out by putting extreme conditions by going through you know like look at the bigger picture and put all those conditions in the in the die level calculation uh, so for for that you need to build you need to build a strong team and secure funding uh, and then comes from the prototype run uh, again uh, for the mpw runs uh, cmc is doing an amazing job uh, by of uh, developing the ecosystem putting together um, 
and then you have a full wafer run this is also not easy from going from mpw to full wafer run so you have to find a suitable uh, a suitable foundry and uh, develop a, a production level fabrication flow uh, secure the ip explore the application for business and then comes then and then you think of a, a commercialization so that means where you have now you have a team now you have a product or at least idea of a product now you need to think about uh, uh, you know securing the money investors uh, having the advisory board and everything so I, I i don't i don't want to go in detail about the this flow uh, because uh, as i mentioned this is never going to be the straight and uh, especially the the things that i've mentioned the blue packaging and testing the reason i mentioned the blue is they are kind of a litmus test uh, uh, to litmus test to um, to actually all the activities that we have been doing whether the design is correct whether the fabrication went okay all these things and then the bottom thing is where you actually make money so that is where uh, you have to win the design uh, design in from the customers uh, so new part integration and then the customer will run a qualification run and then pilot run and the customer ramp up so all these things are typically takes uh, you know uh, roughly 3 3 years at least the minimum of 3 years uh, and 3 to 5 years in my opinion um, so yep uh, this is a very linear path to commercialization but it never happens uh, so i will explain what are the challenges we have faced um, and uh, Naresh, maybe uh, just a minute or two more and then questions. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Uh, the challenges we have faced are basically to develop a industry standard fabrication process flow because uh, uh, the process flow, what we develop at the lab may not be acceptable by the commercial foundries. So we need to always look for a standard for fabrication flow uh, as robust as possible. And then uh, the yield of the MEMS fabrication is very important. And generally, if we hit even 60 to 70 percent of yield, that's amazing. That is actually considered as a great yield uh, by the MEMS. And uh, improve the designs, validate after characterization thoroughly, do everything, and start everything very early because uh, time is equals to money. And uh, every time we uh, lose in the production build, so that actually takes up a lot of your uh, synchronization with all of the steps. The ASIC design and MEMS packaging is a Pandora box. So the moment when you come to that level, everything is going to change. Everything is going to shift uh, um, to, you know, we have to be really, really take the position of devil's advocate and uh, be very cautious. Um, and the, the lessons that we have learned and uh, yeah, been learning is basically to investigate the design thoroughly in all possible ways. Uh, we need to start everything early, start everything way sooner than, uh, than later. Uh, including the fabrication, going to the ASIC, uh, also going to the um, going to the right foundries and uh, trying to talk to them about the standard process flow, uh, develop a very robust standard fabrication flow, and then provide enough breathing space for the packaging failures. Because as I mentioned, packaging is its own uh, its own a crazy field, and uh, if something fails, we need to have enough breathing space over there, and ensure that the engineering timeline. Uh, that matches with what how the company is looking at the sales forecast and the roadmap and again so time is always 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 more than money especially in this field yeah uh, thank you guys thank you for your time uh, let's move on then if you don't mind i'm very pleased to introduce valen rosazadeh uh, founder and ceo of transion uh, valen also uh, did his um, higher studies at the University of Alberta in solid state electronics, and also went west, uh, east, I'm sorry, <laughs> to uh, IBM Albany, where they have a huge fab. There's some really fascinating pictures in the Wall Street Journal recently of the insides of these 300 millimeter fabs. The, the complexity and scale is astonishing. I, I come from a fair sized fab at Nortel, but these, these things are just amazing. Uh, but he did not apparently drink the uh, silicon Kool-Aid and did come back west again uh, to start Transion, uh, pursuing wideband gap, um, specifically, I think, gallium nitride devices uh, and for microwave power and other applications. And um, so I will turn it over to him to speak about uh, title is right here. Uh, is uh, an interesting one toward a high value semiconductor supply chain in Canada. Valen, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks so much, John. I uh, appreciate the intro. And um, yeah, I, uh, you know, uh, have thought about my uh, move back 
uh, long and hard, but uh, you know, I'm uh, I'm really grateful to be back in Canada. And um, I think that's going to be a, a big part of what I'm talking about today um, and um, hopefully stimulate some discussion about, you know, where we perceive ourselves in, in uh, the global semiconductor industry and how we can improve upon that. So, uh, so thanks again. Hopefully you can all see my screen now. Um, I'm assuming you can, if you can't just let me know, but uh, so I, I don't really want to talk too much about myself or Transion um, because um, I, I think there's some more interesting topics to talk about right now, but just to give you a really brief overview. Um, so we are a semiconductor startup based in Edmonton. Uh, we started business operations around three and a half years ago. So we've been busy uh, working on uh, development of our product since then. Um, we're actually one of the only companies in Canada that's domestically fabricating microelectronics. Um, you know, most of our local industry is more on the MEM side of things. Uh, there are a couple other startups in the space, but um, but it's 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 a bit uncommon at this point. Uh, we're primarily focused on wide band gap uh, devices. Uh, so we um, our, our our main product is uh, is a gallium nitride based solution, but we have done work on beta gallium oxide in the past. And uh, primary applications are for high frequency. So uh, we aren't in the power space, but uh, we primarily focus on microwave and RF. Uh, uh devices and integrated circuits and um i think we're kind of an interesting uh, uh company in that way because we are really deeply embedded in the in the, the ecosystem here in canada with regards to um you know the uh, the shared use facilities and and the wide network of uh, fabrication uh uh resources across canada that uh, cmc is obviously very involved with um so just a really really quick uh, summary of uh, what we do. Um, uh, we're we're basically developing a, a, a nanoscale, highly scaled gate length uh, gallium nitride device and uh, process technology, and um, we've uh, proven this out to to uh, demonstrate higher performance than the leading um, uh, commercial GAN platforms available right now. Um, and uh, we're currently working on taking that to market hopefully uh, within uh, uh, the next year or so. Uh, and some of the partners we've worked with in the past, obviously, you know, uh, lots of engagement locally. So just to um, maybe give a quick summary of what I want to talk about today, uh, I want to just briefly touch on the state of the Canadian semiconductor industry, um, identify some of the primary factors I see for success uh, in semiconductor, uh, how we stack up against those metrics compared to some of our peers, and then maybe looking at some of those, uh, uh, the things that they're doing that we aren't um, uh, for benchmarking purposes, and finally some recommendations. So what is the state of the global industry? Well, I think we all know it by now. Uh, we're seeing unprecedented demand. Um, you know, everybody's got to get their hands on a PS5 or a car and um, obviously those all have, uh, extensive semiconductor components in them. Uh, so this has led to really, a, a, almost like an accordion effect of, uh, supply chain shortages. We're now seeing, see, uh, tooling, um, uh, parts for tool sets, uh, raw materials, and, uh, especially uh, this is being seen everywhere, but, uh, not just in semiconductor, uh, huge labor shortages as well, especially, uh, for skilled labor. Uh, you mix in some of the craziest uh, geopolitical volatility we've seen since the fall of Soviet Union, and the end result is that uh, we, we now see people actually caring about the semiconductor industry and not taking it for granted. Uh, you know, obviously, this is a positive in some ways, but it does prove a bit challenging because um, um, lots of countries across the world now are, are scrambling to compete with one another to reshore and develop their domestic industries, which um, could lead to increased competition down the line. So where's the Canadian industry at? And um, basically we only have, uh, and you know, this is based on my knowledge. So, you know, please don't send me angry emails or anything like this. This is uh, what I can find publicly, but we, we only have three 
commercial fabs, to my knowledge, um, two of which are owned by Teledyne, uh, which would be Microline and Dalsa, uh, both primarily focused on MEMS, as well as uh, on Semis Fab in Burlington. Um, I think this is a CMOS fab, but I'm not sure. There wasn't a lot of info uh, up there publicly, but um, we also have two, uh, I, I would say, not quite commercial facilities, but um, uh, fully uh, qualified fabrication facilities that do commercial work. Um, so this would be CPFC in Ottawa, uh, as well as uh, C2MI, um, uh, which is really deeply embedded in the Bromont ecosystem. Um, and uh, along with that, the, there's a, a few other big players. Obviously, IBM has a, a big packaging facility in Bromont, which kind of is the tail end of their uh, Hudson Valley corridor. Um, we also have GAN Systems, which is a, is uh, fabulous, but um, you know works with TSMC for their products. But they're they've quickly grown to become one of the largest um, uh, semiconductor companies in the country, as well as uh, formerly ATI uh, AMD, based in Markham and the Toronto area. So um, if you look at it this way, well. We look at most of the new startups and uh, new players in, in the semi industry here, and they've almost all been fabulous um, uh, for a long time. Now, this has changed significantly, I would say, in the past five years. Um, and, but uh, traditionally, you know, there was a lot of companies developing ASICs, um, doing IC design innovations because of the ease of access. Um, you know, it's a lot easier to get EDA tools than it is to get a facility where you can churn out even prototypes, never mind uh, uh, volume production. Uh, our larger players are all subsidiaries um, of uh, major public US companies. So Teledyne and OnSemi are both uh, pretty big players in the States. Um, and then outside of that, we're really concentrated in SMEs. Um, I think the end result of this uh, is that we haven't really had a lot of manufacturing growth compared to similar sized countries. Um, so our peers in Europe, uh, France, Germany, Belgium, which are all you know comparable in size to Canada, um, but are doing quite well, on, at least on the fabrication side of things. The one silver lining in all of this is that you know our open access university-based facilities have put a lot into supporting industry in the past five years, which is why I started with that caveat in that a lot of startups uh, coming out of universities now are actually focusing on prototyping and actually building things um, uh, in Canada, which bodes well, I think, uh, for future uh, growth. But I'm gonna talk about maybe some of the steps we can do to, to enhance that further. So uh, as I'm sure many of you are familiar with, um, Minister Champagne in February announced that um, uh, $150 million was going to be contributed to uh, the Strategic Innovation Fund um, through ICED to make uh, investments directly into the semiconductor industry and hopefully uh, bolster that. Uh, this was in addition to $90 million that was committed to CPFC. Um, ICED identified three main areas at the time, uh, MEMS, Compound Semi, and Advanced Packaging. And lo and behold, these are all areas, I think, of strength for Canada. Um, but uh, it's still unclear how this is going to work and what the details of this are going to be. So they're still doing, you know, consultations and hopefully through presentations like this and, you know, getting this discussion going, we can start to influence that a little bit and point them in the right direction. So where do I see the areas of improvement? I think we have four areas um, that are really key for success. Number one is enabling access to cutting edge tooling and uh, capabilities for fabrication. Uh, number two would be enhancing our talent pool, making sure that we have local resources available to, to you know, work for these companies because, uh, you know, that that's not a given. Uh, number three would be really targeting the government funding um, for firms that need it, particularly on the er earlier side of things and then also in the uh, scale up side. And then also uh, private sector funding. I'm not really going to talk too much about that, but um, we'll just touch on it. So for the first uh, first item there. Um, I would say we have some significant strengths already. And like I mentioned, you know, our shared use facilities have done a really good job of enhancing capabilities. Um, you know, we do a lot of work at the NanoFab, but we also have worked with 
uh, partners um, at 4D Labs and um, uh, uh, Waterloo QNF FCF, and um, you know they have amazing capabilities. Um, I think we've got all the tooling we need to run uh, a GAN line. Uh, I wouldn't call it a line per se because it's not continuously moving, but um, but we do have everything we need to go from start to finish to make GAN microelectronics products, which is really amazing. Um, these tool sets are mostly centered around 100 to 150 millimeter wafers. Um, and uh, the nice thing is they are comparable to what you would find in 150 millimeter manufacturing for the most part. So that enables a, a seamless transition to manufacturing down the line. There are some drawbacks though. The primary ones being, we don't really have any access to production litho systems. Um, you know, steppers are very few and far in between and scanners, you can absolutely forget it. So um, that really bottlenecks things, especially if you want to transition to production. Uh, there isn't enough ca capacity in the shared use facilities for medium volume production, probably only low volume to prototyping levels. And there's essentially, um, outside of C2MI, I don't think there's any um, uh, open access 200 millimeter capabilities, and there's definitely no 300 millimeter capabilities in Canada. So, so to look at what other countries are doing, um, I mean, you know, I want to give a few examples. Um, IMEC is a really interesting one because, you know, IMEC has grown to become probably the world's foremost R&D organization in the semiconductor world. And they were set up by the Flemish regional government in Belgium. So Flanders is like one half of Belgium. It's a tiny place, very small GDP compared to Canada. But, um, you know, they've grown this to become a huge force in CMOS and more than more technologies. So um, I think they get like an annual grant of 100 million euro. Um, but they've really grown to, to, to generate significant levels of revenue through their uh, manufacturing partners who include big companies like ASML, and Intel, so on and so forth. So um, this type of facility is sort of, uh, you know, one option, but you don't really have to go all the way. I, I'm just providing this as sort of an example because um, this was done for 300 millimeter, super high volume cutting edge nodes. Um, if you were to take that type of model and apply it to something similar to maybe a 150 millimeter and 200 mill millimeter production, um, you'd be able to do this at a significantly lower cost. Uh, another case study, basically the same model is uh, where I used to work uh, in Albany, New York. Um, and so they, they grew that out of the State University of New York um, and just built fabs uh, or like clean room space that just was modular and, and, and it grew over time. They got more tenants. IBM was obviously the anchor for that, but, you know, Global Foundry, Samsung, AMAT, Tel, uh, they all came there over time and that really grew to uh, a, a significant size. So, um, you know, really was a huge um, economic booster for the upstate New York region. Um, and uh, as, a, as an example of what's being done in the GAN world, this isn't a, a, an R&D facility, but this is actually a production facility that was recently built by NXP. Uh, so it was a greenfield facility, brand new, um, and uh, wasn't really producing, I would say, cutting, cutting edge. They're doing 250 nanometer devices right now, and the, 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 the more advanced node is 150 nanometer. But uh, they managed to do this for around $100 million dollars. And this site is able to source half the total global market for GAN. So the point I want to make is that this can be done on a relatively small budget. You don't need to build a facility like, uh, you know, Intel's new facility in, in Ohio, um, but you can do it uh, with a relatively reasonable cost. In terms of talent, um, you know, I think we've got an excellent bedrock of engineering programs. We've got great research groups and we've got an excellent innovation culture. However, we don't really have a lot of groups who are working on uh, topics relative, relevant to volume fabrication. We also don't have any anchor company here that's like a big Intel style company. And we have a really big brain drain due to competition with the US. Uh, if we're to look again, back again, um, you know, Universities like NC State and UC Santa Barbara really built these uh, centers of excellence around materials engineering, device uh, design, and circuit design that really allowed 
companies like Cree and Wolfspeed, which are, you know, one of the largest um, GAN companies in the world, as well as Transform, which has become a really big startup in that space. So that's something we can look to uh, on that side of things. Um, government funding, uh, we've done a lot in recent years with, um, you know, um, uh, funding programs like Ideas, Innovative Solutions Canada, uh, but we've really prioritized making widgets over really big picture technologies, and we don't have the flexibility in these funds. So, um, you know, one thing we can do is look to SBIR in the States. That's worked out really well for them, and they've really used it to to tailor it to the R&D needs of the US federal government, not just like, hey, we have an application, we want something. We're going to build things from the ground up. And if you look at GAN, for instance, again, I keep going back to that because that's what I do. Um, these are like fundamental device technologies that can be built um, uh, through these uh, SBIR grants. Uh, whereas you compare it to, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, Innovative Solutions Canada topic that we received funds through and, you know, it was really broad. It didn't have the same um, uh, pull uh, for building semiconductor technologies. And we haven't seen anything like that since then. So, um, yeah, I know I'm a little short on time. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll wrap it up really quickly here. Um, basically, private sector funding non-existent we really got to get vcs going on on uh on on um uh risky deep tech investments and and really get them to 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 buy in so my recommendations to summarize uh we really need access to open access facilities for medium volume production at 150 200 millimeters uh we got to sustain efforts to continue to engage research groups on topics that are relevant to industry establish centers of excellence in our key areas of competence, target our government funds better, especially on the semiconductor side of things to, to build industrial capacity, and then also promote our industry. And that's it. Sorry, guys. <laughs> okay, uh, moving along to our last speaker, I'm, I'm really pleased to introduce Aaron Rishu, who again, um, did his studies in Alberta condensed matter physics and then had the very good fortune to go down to Stanford and study in, and work in Mark Bron Bronsma's group. Came back north again to Ninton, Calgary, and um, and then moved across to manage the Fab Group at the Nanofab. Uh, it's very well named. I'm, I'm working with the Nanofab um, here in University of Ottawa, <laughs> um, the Nanofab at UL, U Alberta and um, it's been there for now a few years. And so uh, don't feel pressurized for time, uh, Aaron. I, 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 we can be a little flexible um, and we will be moving along eventually. Go ahead, thank you. Super, thanks, John. Uh, everyone's good with the, uh, you can see my slides. Yes, and sound. Just yep, you're, lo you're looking Perfect. good. All right, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so I would, this presentation is gonna be a little bit different from the previous two which we've had. Um, this is going to be um, a little bit more, or a lot more actually focus on a specific application which we've found has been useful for, um, uh, for academic groups in particular, but also for, um, uh, there's some industrial groups who have started to use this type of process technique. So what I'm going to do is start with a, a very brief um, overview of what the NanoFab is and our capabilities, and then dive right into the specific process we'd like to highlight, and that's multi-level deep etching in uh, silicon. So the NanoFab, we're an open access service training and collaboration center at the University of Alberta working in the uh, micro and nano fabrication and characterization space. We've been around for just over uh, 20 years or so, and we've got a staff of 18, which uh, serves a, a fairly large number of active um, user groups. So we're about, about half uh, internal University of Alberta academic groups, and then split pretty evenly between external academic groups and industrial groups such as uh, Transion, if we just heard from Valen. Um, you know, on the fabrication side of things, we have uh, you know, the usual suspects here, nearly all of the um, technologies required for semiconductor processing, lithography, thin film deposition, uh, wet dry etching, all those types of things, as well as a, uh, a couple of more niche 
uh, capabilities such as two photon polymerization. This is our uh, nanoscribe system, which is effectively a um, micro nanoscale 3D printer with 200 nanometer uh, lateral resolution. On the characterization side of things, we've got a pretty complete suite of analysis tools kind of split in uh, between advanced uh, microscopy. This is ion and electron beam microscopy, uh, surface spectroscopy, XPS, uh, um, Topsims, OJ, Raman, and a uh, variety of materials analysis techniques. Now, uh, one tool which uh, we've recently acquired, which has proven to be quite valuable, I'd like to point out is our uh, Zeiss X-ray Versa X-ray microscope. This allows you to do micro and nanoscale CT scanning. So that's non-destructive testing with about a 200 nanometer or 200 nanometer resolution. Um, here's a, some examples up here showing sort of the wide variety of specimens, everything from cell phones to rocks to uh, 3D printed structures um, and the 3D uh, reconstructions that we've made from from those. So um, if you're interested in that, we can you can talk to my counterpart, Peng, on the characterization side. All right. So I'm going to move now right into the particular process highlight, um, which uh, hinges on deep reactive ion etching. So this is DRIE, uh, deep reactive ion etching in silicon. It's a mainstay of MEMS processing. Certainly Naresh has used uh, uh, this process in, uh, in his MEMS devices. Um, so this is using the cyclic Bosch process, which is schematized here. We've got kind of cycles of uh, burst of isotropic etching followed by fluoropolymer deposition to, um, to protect the sidewalls of what you have just etched, uh, followed by more, more another etching step. Now, Bosch etching is great. You can get really deep, highly ionisotropic etches with vertical sidewalls. Um, you know, you're looking at 10 microns kind of per minute. So you can go 10 to hundreds of microns deep, no problem, even going through wafer, um, high aspect ratio features. And you really got a great selectivity here. So you can get about 100 to 1 selectivity for between silicon and photoresist and about 300 to 1 for uh, thermal oxide. Um, so this is like a widely used uh, technology. We are... Um, DRAE tool is heavily, heavily used by both academics and industry. Now, um, some challenges can arise, however, if you're looking at using DRAE to make multi-level designs. And in this case, I'm talking about um, designs where your topography has several different um, etch depths, several different feature heights, where those features are something like more than 10 microns or so uh, beyond um, from step to step. And an example is shown here. Um, this comes up often in uh, PDMS microfluidics, um, perhaps more so than in MEMS. But uh, we do a lot of these sorts of things where you're making a, a mold for PDMS casting. Um, and in this case, uh, this multi-level design is such that you've got two large channels, about 100 microns um, tall. And these are joined by a series of very small fins, um, less than 10 microns in depth. So the challenge arises not really from the DRIE itself, but how are you doing lithography, photolithography over the types of topographies, topographies you can make easily with DRIE. So you're talking about 10, 20, 50 micron, you know, 100 micron etch depths. So this is really a twofold problem. One is how are you going to spin your resist over such topography and how are you going to expose it? So with, um, you know, said, you get about 100 to 1 um, selectivity with resist. So you may only need about a micron of resist to etch a 100 micron deep trench. But how are you going to now spin coat over that topography um, to be able to get a, uh, uh, to resolve your next uh, level of design, which may be at the bottom of this trench. So you know, spin coating over um, such topography can be difficult. You can get sort of pooling of resist against existing features. Uh, um, this can make it uh, fr frustrate efforts to try to really resolve small feature sizes um, down in those trenches. Now, there are a couple of ways to get around this. If you're fortunate enough to have a, um, uh, a spray coater system, you can perhaps uh, use that to spray coat resist over these big topographies kind of more uniformly. Um, there are more esoteric things such as uh, electroplated resists, but for, um, or for spin coating, you could try using a much thicker resist to kind of fill in that 
um, topography variation, but then now you're looking at, you know, trying to resolve a small feature and you've got tens of microns of reassist, which can become a problem. Now, um, Perspective of that, you've so, if you've managed to coat your um, coat your specimen, you now have the problem of exposing resist at the bottom of this trench. So, like I said, you've got a 20, 50, 100 micron deep trench. Um, if you've got a contact mask liner, now that you know is effectively a 10, you know, 20, 50, 100 micron um, exposure gap, and diffraction can make it difficult to get you know a nice small feature well resolved at the bottom of that trench. And as the more you know, the more levels you have of this sort of thing, the more difficult this becomes. So the one solution to this, there may be others, but the solution that I like to discuss um, is uh, this. And basically, we leverage that really high, you know, three hundred to one um, selectivity you can get with oxide for DRAE to construct your a multi-level oxide hard mask prior to doing any DR DRAE. And this allows you to sort of compress the topography by that selectivity factor, um, such that the largest topography variation that you need to worry about is just that of the oxide hard mask. And this can be you know, 500 nanometers, one micron, sufficient to go you know, hundreds of microns deep. So I'll illustrate that um, going forward. We've got this sort of proof of concept example that we made. Um, uh, consisting of you know, five different pillar heights, you know, from 20 up to 100 microns, as well as three different edge depths. And these are you know, 40, uh, 60, 80 microns. This would be something which traditionally would be hard in general to spin coat with a one micron resist. There may be certain patterns, certain um, uh, designs, which you still are able to just spin coat as usual. But in general, this can cause problems. So I'm going to blow through now this uh, this uh, process flow. On the left, I've got um, sort of a schematic of both the pillar and trench regions. And on the right, I've got um, just inspection microscope images of, of each step. So we start off, we've got a silicon substrate, 500 nanometers of thermal oxide. And we do our first litho process here um, to make your first layer. We now etch a quarter of the way through, that's 100 nan 125 nanometers of um, the oxide, strip the resist, do your next litho step, and we just repeat this, always etching a quarter of the way through, strip, etch, strip, etch. And at this point, now you can see here, we've opened, we've etched all the way down to our, um, and opened up to our bare silicon. Now, our final etch masks that we can use, we can strip and just use um, photoresist. So now at this point, we've set up our multi-layer or our multi-level oxide uh, mask. And going forward, um, there's no more litho at all. So all of this was just standard, very planar kind of substrate. Yes, there are five litho steps, but it's quite easy, to, quite easy to do. Um, so we've got, as you can see here, these five or these four different oxide thicknesses and then the resist which is um, serving as our mask. So we now go on to DRIE, no more litho going forward. So we do our first 20 microns of etch and then strip our resist. And now you can see that this initial pillar um, is no longer protected. Um, and now yeah, just, just the particular choice of uh, features um, of depth I've chosen for this design. Now we're opening up, we haven't done any DRE on our trenches yet, but we will be going forward. As we do our next DRIE step, that uh, initial pillar over here, which um, is no longer protected, it's getting etched equally on the sides and on the top. So this just carries down and maintains that um, pillar thickness or pillar height. We now do a uh, an RIE step to remove the thinnest remaining oxide that opens up the next layer of um, trench or pillar that we're going to etch, and now. We just repeat this, keep, keep on going, another 20 microns of DRAE, remove the next oxide uh, layer, more DRAE, more oxide, more DRAE. Now at this point, all the DRAE is done. Uh, we haven't done any litho during the DRAE processing. And um, just due to the small depth of focus for the optical microscope, this doesn't look really fantastic. But so we're going to move to, uh, for inspection of the final device, we'll take a look at, uh, at this using a helium ion microscopy, which has a nice depth of focus, really, um, really good tool. So here's the final kind of um, topographies for the trench structure at right and the pillar structure at left. And you can see these nicely, closely spaced, well-defined um, pillars, very vertical sidewalls. Um, 
the one kind of obvious kind of defect that you can see here is that most of the pillars have this kind of ring of um, uh, sort of a crown of Bosch sidewall polymer. My apologies, we didn't end up really spending enough time removing that before doing this imaging. But this is something that you can do. You can get rid of that at at the end with more um, sort of more robust oxygen plasma ashing and uh, and wet processing. But the the main takeaway here is that even the smallest pillar lying at the bottom here, this 20 micron pillar, it's nicely, it's well formed, um, still vertical sidewalls, no kind of rounding of the top edges. Um, you know, it's as, as nicely formed kind of as this uh, tallest pillar. And given the spacing of these pillars, it would be very difficult to do this sort of thing with sequential steps of litho DRIE, litho DRIE. So we do all of our work up front, and then it's just plain sailing afterwards as far as DRE goes. Uh, just a couple of more beauty shots here. This is sort of the, uh, the um, interface between the, the pillar region and the, and the um, uh, uh, trench region, and then just the top view where you can clearly see the three different pillar depths, or sorry, three different trench depths. Um, this is just a, an Escher-esque type of um, tiling, which was interesting to pattern. All right. Now, I guess I will move on to, we've got two sort of real life application examples uh, in microfluidics. So the first is here from the group of Sean Sanders at the University of Guelph. And this is a, in fact, exactly the uh, uh, type of pro, um, design that I showed in that initial example, where we've got 100 micron main channels and then some sub 10 micron uh, micro channels that are bridging the two. And so you can see these are this is um, a simpler process, only two, two different layers, one oxide hard mask and one resist hard mask to be able to create this. Um, the second example and final one I have is from the group of Ann Benneker from the University of Calgary. A little bit of a different design here. Um, in this, we've got a microfluidics um, process where you've got uh, a central region full of porous, uh, sort of central porous region with um, closely spaced pillars. And then you've got these 10 micron um, sort of barriers, which are restricting flow from the outside channels into the uh, inner region or, or vice versa. Um, so this is a um, this middle section here, the optical profilometry scan. Um, and you can see um, the pillar region, 50 microns deep, and then our little barrier, which is 10 microns deep. So, those are the two uh, sort of real life examples I have. Um, please feel free to contact us if you have any service inquiries or questions about uh, our capabilities. You can talk to me um, for any fabrication related stuff and Peng Lee, my counterpart on the characterization group side um, for any characterization um, work that you may have. So thank you uh, for your attention.